Hi, how are you all? What a great two days it's been. Um, thank you so much for having me back. I love this conference, it's so much fun. I always learn a ton. So I wanna talk today about uh, being a ride or die PM, which may or may not have been inspired by my love of the Fast and the Furious. Um, last year when I did my keynote, I gave everyone homework to watch um, 12 hours of the Lord of the Rings extended edition because that was sort of the theme of my talk. So this year I would like to assign you 16 hours of the eight Fast and the Furious movies. Um, you won't regret it, it really picks up around five. Um, but you know, watch the, watch the intro ones just to like get the background. Although I will say, I started with five and I really didn't miss any of the key references. So I went back and watched the other ones later. Um, okay, so hi, this is me, I'm Megan. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Irish Girl. Um, as Brett mentioned, I wrote a book. Um, and I've been a project manager in some sense officially for about 20 years. Um, my current title, as Brett mentioned, is COO of Clockwork. And the way that I describe the job of being a COO is I am a project manager. The company is now my project or my product, depending on how you want to look at it. So I still very much identify myself as a project manager and find myself using the skills of project management all of the time in the work that I do. Um, I have two kids and a dog, um, and I will let you guess which one of them is my favorite. But in case you need a hint, um, it's Taco. <laughs> He's my favorite. Um, so because I came up in my career as a project manager and, and I still consider myself a project manager at heart, I'm in this unique position where I get to act as a project manager and use those skills. I get to mentor project managers both inside clockwork and, and outside of the organization organization, and I get to be project managed because I still show up as a resource for some of my teams. In fact, where's Courtney? There's Courtney. Courtney's one of my coworkers. I am on one of her projects. Pray for Courtney. She's trying to project manage me. <laughs> good, good luck. <laughs> um, so over time, I've noticed that some project managers um, are able to transcend the kind of tactical delivery parts of the job and be seen by clients and team members as truly strategic partners. And in many ways, I, I think that's what most of us want. That's what I always wanted. I never wanted to be just the person who was helping get the work done. I always wanted to have a bigger role in the why we were doing what we were doing. Um, so we do things like, you know, make timelines and schedules because we have to because it gets us to an outcome we want, but that's not the part of the job that really gets most of us out of bed in the morning. Um, we do those things because we like the result, not the thing. And so I really wanted to explore, like what is it in the, in the times in my career when I've been able to transcend to that level of like strategic partnership, what is it that I did? And when I see other project managers doing that, what is it that they've done to get there and kind of break that down? So just starting with like, what do we even mean when we say ride or die? I never like to assume knowledge of anything. So I also really enjoy looking up slang words like for an official dictionary definition. Um, Cause can't you just picture, like you can hear Alexa reading this uh, description. So it's an expression of extreme loyalty to someone or something. So what does this concept of ride or die look like um, as a PM? Um, it's when you leave an agency and go to another agency and a client or team members want to follow you there. Um, it's when a client leaves their organization and hires you again at their next job. Um, it's when team members ask to be put on your projects. So there, I think all of us maybe have experienced that. If you're new, you will experience it someday and it is a magical feeling. Um, and I wanna kinda of break down how we get there. So here's what we're gonna do. This is our route to ride or die. I'm gonna make a series of bold opening statements. <laughs> then I'm gonna lay out a path to strategic partnership. Then I'm gonna give you an inspiring closing statement because it's the last presentation of the last day of the conference. And if I don't talk too much, we might have time for some questions. Ready, sound good? Okay. Yeah. It's a little half-assed. You ready? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, all right start with some bold opening statements. Okay, strategy is nothing more than a relentless focus on outcomes with an awareness of constraints. 
this, the word strategy has become so wrapped in bullshit over time. Like, have, have you guys noticed that? And like, also wrapped in this like, oh, this is strategy, like you couldn't possibly understand. But really, truly, in all the work I've done in 20 years, in all the reading and research that I've done about strategy, it is nothing more than outcomes within whatever constraints are at hand. That's what it is. So I wanted to sort of level set on my definition of strategy. Strategy that's disconnected from delivery is fantasy. And I don't know if you guys have had this experience. It happened to me more when I was in advertising and marketing focused agencies than it does now um, at Clockwork, which is very focused on technology. But we would get these strategy documents from creative that were like not possible within either the time space continuum or the available technology. But the creative director would be like, well, that's the strategy, like figure it out. So when people do this also, Tara talked about um, P, like a, a path to, um, a path for PMs being into business development. And I love that idea because often the tension that exists between us and business development is because of this. Because the client was sold a strategy, an idea, that then the delivery team is like, we can't actually do that. So at Clockwork, all of our business development team is actually former PMs, and it's brilliant because when they're selling, they understand how to sell within the constraints of delivery. And working within the constraints of delivery does not have to limit your thinking. In fact, I think it makes you more creative. How are we gonna actually solve this problem? Not how would I solve this problem if I had no constraints? Anybody can do that. Solving problems within constraints is hard. Project managers are strategists who have delivery expertise. Every one of you is a strategist, and I'm gonna to talk to you about the ways in which strategy shows up in the work that you're doing, and the ways that you can push yourself toward operating at a more strategic level and helping other people see you as being strategic. So whether we don't know that we're actually strategists yet, because we're new to the role, or whether we forgot over time, um, I, wa I wanna help us remember how we can focus as much on the strategy as we do on the delivery. Now I think it's easy to focus on delivery because it's kind of part of our name. Like our name does not really, our title does not really express strategy and strategic thinking. Um, and honestly, I don't know, maybe we need a new name at some point, people. Maybe, pro like for me, it doesn't feel like project manager really covers the scope of what digital and interactive project managers really actually do. So maybe we should rename ourselves, thought, thought for the future. Okay, so last bold statement. If we show up differently, we will be seen differently. So I wanna talk about how we show up differently. I really loved that um, Venn diagram that um, Yvette showed of PMing and all of the overlaps that we have with all of these other disciplines. I think my one argument with it is I think there should be more of an overlap with the strategy part of the Venn diagram than what was shown. So let's talk about the, the path to partnership. So as I was thinking about this idea of like, okay, how do we get from point A to point B, the kind of frameworks or mental models that I was using were two things. One was the first thing that popped into my mind is like, oh, this is like Maslow's hierarchy, right? We don't get to self-actualization. We don't get to strategic partnership until we've met some of these lower level needs. And in, in Maslow's kind of hierarchy, the, the bottom ones are focused on our self, our safety, our physiological needs. Um, the next ones are focused on, focused on our relationship with the people around us. Um, and then the top one is, is focused on this you know, self-actualized state. Now with Maslow, in, in his original theory, he was like, you can't move to the next one until you've really achieved the first one. So the other one I looked at, um, Aaron mentioned Five Dysfunctions of a Team. I would underscore that that is a, an amazing book. You should read it. I read it every year, and I get something new out of it every year. Um, and if you're, if you're listening to a lot of the sessions over the last two days about like team building and emotional intelligence and all these things and wondering, like, yeah, but how? That book really outlines the how in a way that, with examples of um, kind of real life, how you encounter some of these dysfunctions and how you deal with them. 
But what I wanted to point out about his framework is it's a little bit more flexible in that you can get to the top level, which is results, if some level of dysfunction exists at those lower levels, because some level of dysfunction or imperfection always exists, it's just that the higher the level of dysfunction at those lower levels, the harder the climb is to get results. And so I took sort of both of those frameworks in thinking to come up with um, my kind of path to strategic uh, partnership for PMs. So this was my sort of first sketch of like, okay, we move from talent, skills, reliability, adaptability, partnership, and I'm, go I'm gonna go into more about what I mean about each of those things in a minute. And so I had this whole presentation that was focused around this kind of triangle. And then I got on the plane to come here, and I was looking at the slides on the plane, and I was like, this is trash. <laughs> <laughs> and I completely set aside my whole original presentation and reworked it because I was like, here's what's wrong with this. It is too one-dimensional. And the things that I'm trying to talk about and the depth of our job and our role, I think this does not accurately reflect it. So over the last um, two days, I completely destroyed my deck and rewrote it. So let's go on a ride together <laughs> of my rebuilt, uh, my rebuilt conception of this path to partnership. It's still a pyramid. Um, so talents is, is where we begin. Talents are things that we are naturally good at, things that are innate, the things that just come very easily to you. Um, I was laughing, I don't know if Colin's still here, but I was laughing when he was doing his presentation because I was like, I literally have the exact same picture of the exact same book in my presentation. Um, so he brought up the book, First Break All the Rules. It's another kind of classic on my, on my shelf. I would highly recommend reading it. The piece that I wanna pull out of that book for today is that it really taught me the difference between talent, skills, and experience. So my sort of um, paraphrasing of how they describe talents, skills, and experience, talents are what we naturally excel at, skills are things we can learn, and experience is what we acquire over time. And of course there's a relationship between skills and experience because your skills get better the more you practice them. But there's this difference between those three things that's kind of important to, to think about. So they further break down three different types of talents. And so again, this is my paraphrasing of how they describe these three different types of talents. So striving talents are like why we get out of bed in the morning, like what drives us. Thinking talents are how we approach problems, how we process information and solve problems. And relating talents are who we build relationships with and how we build those relationships. So um, in the book, the, this is the list in the back of, of that book of these are all the striving talents, thinking talents, relating talents, and I'll share this deck um, afterwards. But you can sort of see how the striving talents have to do with like competition, competence, mission, belief. Thinking is more about arranging, discipline, concepting, strategy, business, and then relating is like empathy, you know, interpersonal skills. So I also wanted to give you guys definitions of each of the talents. I'm gonna read them word for word to you over the next 20 minutes, just kidding. Um, <laughs> So I just wanted you to have them because I'm going to share the deck with you afterwards and I, I'm going to give you a little bit of homework about how to think about these talents. So I did provide slides that give you a description of what each of those talents actually are um, because the names themselves aren't that descriptive. But really what it comes down to is that, and this is where I, I was like, okay, I need the pyramid to not be flat because talents are about self-awareness and finding meaning in our work. So at the base level, of course, you need core talents, but more importantly, you need to connect to meaning or love of what you do. And I know that, you know, I say that at the risk of sounding a little bit cheesy, but it's true. You can have all the talent in the world, but if in your core, you don't love your job, your company, your team, it's gonna show. I don't, it does not matter how talented you are. So we have to find the love, we have to find the happiness, we have to find the meaning. And one mistake I often see people make is thinking that meaning only comes from a certain type of work. Um, so I, one example is I was talking to a hairdresser years ago and she was sort of dismissing the work that she does. She's like, oh, I, just, I just cut hair. And I was like, 
do you have any idea the effect of a good haircut? <laughs> do you have any idea of the effect of a bad haircut? Like, you're not just cutting hair. You are affecting how someone presents themselves to the world, how they perceive themselves. Like, that, there's meaning in something that seems like sort of a task-oriented job. So um, often I'll hear people say like, oh, you know, I'm, I think I'm gonna quit my job and work for a nonprofit because I want meaning. And I'm like, you get that a nonprofit is just another kind of organization, right? Like, it doesn't magically, like, only good people don't work at nonprofits. Like, they still have dysfunction, <laughs> right? So don't mistake meaning for, like, I have to be saving the world. No, meaning comes from showing up with your talents and doing the work you were meant to do. Um, one other thing, I was listening to an interview with Terry Crews, the actor, and um, the interviewer asked him, what piece, of have, uh, what piece of advice have you gotten in your life that's really stuck with you? And he said uh, that once someone told him there is no way to happiness, happiness is the way. And it just like really stuck with me. I was like, damn, that's really good. Like we just have to choose happiness. That is the way. And by the way, then I Googled that because I was like, there's no way that some random person just made that up and said it to Terry Crews. And depending on who you ask, that was like either said by Buddha, Wayne Dyer, or some third person I don't remember. So who knows who actually said it, but it was cool. So going back to that concept of meaning and how we find meaning, in the slides I have a link to this episode of NPR's Hidden Brain where this researcher from Yale talked about the study she did on work and meaning. And she studied a whole bunch of different, um, different uh, job roles. The one that stuck with me, though, is the um, hospital cleaning staff people that she talked to. So she asked all of these different um, staff members who cleaned hospital rooms to describe their work. And one group of the cleaners described their work as being highly skilled, and the other described it as being low skill work, like anyone can do this. And when she dug further into why do some people think it's high skilled and some people think it's low skill, the difference between the two was that one group just stuck to the job description. Like we wash the floors, we wipe the counters, like we do these things. And the job description didn't include anything about interacting with anyone else. You don't interact with patients or staff or, or families or anything. The other group talked about what they did for and with doctors, nurses, patients, and visitors. They crafted the boundaries of their job in a way that made the work more meaningful to them. And they actually described themselves as healers. Like they saw the work that they did as being part of the healing process. So they focused not on like following the job description, but on how what they did served the larger mission of the hospital. And one example was there was um, a cleaner who worked on a long-term rehab floor. So a lot of the patients were in, had been in comas for a really long time. Um, she would take the artwork down and move it around, like rehang it. So that, because her, her, like, what she told the researcher was, well, I know they're not technically awake, but I keep thinking, like, maybe if, you know, their environment sort of changes a bit, like, maybe that will help them. And I just found that so touching. Like, if that was my relative or me in a coma in the room, like, yes, I want someone in there who's not just, like, mopping the floor and banging it against the bed, but, like, you know what, I'm going to move the artwork for this woman. Another example were the cleaners that said that they would get into the empty hospital beds when the rooms um, were not occupied, they would lay in the bed and look around to see what is the patient gonna see that might annoy them, that I should clean, oh, I need to clean that fan up there because there's dust on it. Like, how amazing is that? And if you read the book, First Break All the Rules, he talks about uh, a similar example with um, cleaning staff at Disney World, that the highest performing um, cleaners at Disney World do exactly the same thing. They lay on the hotel bed and they look around to see like, if I'm a guest, what's the experience that I'm gonna have? So I say all of that just to say like, you can make meaning in whatever it is that you do when you're taking advantage of the talents that you have. So the things that I would like you to sort of take away from this and do is to look at that list of talents that I gave you um, and highlight the ones that you think best describe you. And don't cheat and be like, well, I'm a little of this, little of that. Like really try to hone it down to like no more than six. If you've ever done Strengths Finder, has anyone done that? Okay, Strengths Finder is based on this. Like the first break, all the rules came first, and then from that they wrote Strengths Finder to help people 
find their talents. So you can also use StrengthsFinder and kind of compare that to this list of talents. So highlight the ones that describe you, and then highlight the ones that you think are expected by your company or your role. And look at how well they match, because the job of project management can look like a lot of things in a lot of different companies. And if you're struggling with the role that you're in or the company that you're in, it may be that they expect a different set of talents from a project manager than the talents that you want to actually show up with. If you're a manager who's hiring, think about which talents am I looking for when I'm hiring? How am I asking questions that help me understand the talents that someone has? And as a project manager, think about what talents are present on my team and are any key talents missing? So start to think through this lens of talents because the thing about talent is you can't teach it. You either have it or you don't. So skills and experience, we can, we can teach skills, we can gain experience, but talents just are who we are. So starting to look through this lens of what are my talents, how do I want to show up, how can I make my talents shine? So the next kind of level of this, um, of, our, of our pyramid is skills. And skills, as I said, are things that we learn and things that we practice. So I put together um, a very incomplete list of you know, important project management skills. There's probably a whole lot more that I have not listed here. So these tend to be all the things that we show up to conferences to try to get better at, or we take classes, or we're trying to kind of learn and improve. And tools and people and emotional intelligence, they're all important here. Um, because people and outcomes really should drive tools and process, not the, not the other way around. So this is the first place where I think strategy really starts to show up. Um, Crystal did a session on navigating organizational politics. Organizational politics are strategy. Now, one thing that I love about her talk is she differentiated between organizational politics and organizational drama. Two different things. I'm not talking about organizational drama. I'm talking about organizational politics, which is understanding the machine and how to get things done inside of that machine. And I don't care how small or flat or cool your organization is, there are some politics somewhere. You have to communicate in a specific way with certain people. So one of the first ways that we can start to show up as strategic thinkers is in these skills and how we show up with these skills. Organizational politics, strategic. Writing a good email, strategic. If you were here last year, I showed an example of an email that a coworker wrote to me. Um, because it was just, it was beautiful. It was like three sentences. It contained, so the information density was amazing. Like so much of our day is spent writing emails and we don't recognize it as a skill because we get so many shitty emails, right? But a really good, effective email, that's a skill. That's a skill you can build. That's a skill you can learn. And it is extremely strategic because a bad email doesn't get the result that you want. I was in a communication seminar once and um, the instructor said, the meaning of your communication is the response that you get. And I loved that because I was like, okay, that puts the onus on me to think about what is the response that I'm looking to get when I send this communication. And if I don't get that response, that's on me because I didn't communicate it well. So we're not gonna get the approval of the design concept. We're not gonna get the reply that we need on time if the way that we've constructed the message is not clear to the recipient. So when we, but when we only look at things through a tactical or executional lens, like I gotta send the email, we lose sight of, of their true importance and we don't do it well. We don't do it in a way that's effective. So we've got this huge list of skills, right? I want to talk a little bit about how you assess the competence of different skills. So there's this competence quadrant. Um, and also when I was rehearsing this last night, I said the word conscious so many times that I stopped being able to say it, which I'm fairly sure is going to happen today. <laughs> um, OK, so we've got unconscious incompetence, conscious incompetence, conscious competence, unconscious competence. Damn it. Guys, we're only getting started. There are a lot of slides about competence. Okay, so the summary of unconscious incompetence is I don't know what I don't know. Like these are blind spots. We just, we don't know what we don't know. Conscious incompetence is I know what I don't know. 
conscious competence is I know what I know. And unconscious competence is I don't know what I know. I'm so good at it, I don't have to think about it anymore. So at the top of the quadrant, those are things that are visible to us. We are conscious of them. We know. The things on the bottom are invisible to us. Um, and one quick thing I want to point out about this, if you look up the concept of this quadrant, most um, descriptions of it will suggest that you try to move things into unconscious competence as soon as you can. But in my experience, you need to be careful about how you do that because once something hits that unconscious competence level, it's a lot harder to recognize when you've done a good job. So as, like, it, th this is really like a hard thing to be aware of, but as things move into that conscious, uh, unconscious competence, like sort of be, oh, be aware of that. Take note of it before it slides into that zone. So this side is low or no skill, the other side is high skill. And with that sort of setup, I want to point out a couple of risk zones as you think about your competence in different sets of skills. So these are what I call the imposter syndrome risk zones. So Rachel, I think, mentioned imposter syndrome yesterday. This is when we doubt our accomplishments and have a fear of being exposed as a fraud. So the way that shows up in the upper left quadrant is, I know I don't know things but you don't know that I don't know. <laughs> but if you find out I know, I'll feel like an idiot. Okay, so that's how, that's how imposter syndrome shows up in that quadrant. In the other quadrant, it's I don't know what I'm good at because I can't see it anymore, it's unconscious to me. So I may underestimate my own ability and assume other people are better than I am. Right, so as we're thinking about skills, Risk zones for imposter syndrome. These are the risk zones for being a know-it-all, right? A person who constantly acts like we know what we're talking about, but it's very evident that's not the case. Fun fact, when I was researching this, I found out that the German name for a know-it-all is Bessavissa. So don't be a Bessavissa, which literally translated means a better knower. Just love that. So. The way that the know-it-all kind of shows up in these quadrants is in the lower left, it's, I don't know that I'm an idiot on this topic, but I talk as if I know. We all know that guy. It's almost always a guy, sorry. It's called mansplaining for a reason. Okay. Um, my mom, side note, my mom uh, the other day was like, you know, you guys think you invented that, but in the 80s, we were talking about male answer syndrome. It's like, hmm, okay. So my mom invented mansplaining is what she wants you to know. Um, then in the upper right quadrant, um, that's, I do know a lot about this, and I am just absolutely insufferable about it, right? So that's how that can show up. Like, we know what we know, and like, we can't wait for you to know it too. Um, then the last kind of risk zones I want to point out are the Dunning-Kruger risk zones. So um, if you're not familiar with this, um, there are two social psychologists, uh, David Dunning and Justin Kruger, did this research and discovered um, this cognitive bias in which people with low ability mistakenly assess their ability as much higher than it is. This is kind of similar to the one we just talked about. But conversely, this is the one I think is so interesting, People with high ability incorrectly assume that things that are easy for them are also easy for other people. And so this is where, as project managers, as communicators, we sometimes have this like misalignment where we're just like, why is that so hard for you? Like, Because we assume something that's easy for us should be easy for everyone else. So the cognitive bias on the unconscious incompetence in that lower left that's really kind of a miscalibration about the self, whereas the unconscious competence is a miscalibration about other people. So we sort of have this whole setup that I wanted to give you kind of a framework in which to think about skills and how to build your skills. So if we kind of then return to this list, like now it looks even more complicated because it's not just boxes that we're trying to check, 
It's how we think about how we show up, how we improve. This, this now becomes how we hone our craft. This is our artistry. This is our expertise. So one of the problems I think we have, and Colin mentioned this in his talk, is that so many of these things get incorrectly labeled as soft skills. So we underestimate how hard they are. And in some cases, they're not even seen as an actual skill, like email, for example. When most people think about, like, do you know how to email? What they literally mean is, like, do you know how to use Gmail? Or do you know how to use Outlook? Which, as a side note, it really cracks me up when people still put that on their resume. Is like, these are the tools I know how to use, like mail, <laughs> internet. I'm like, that's, that's cool. Um, good for you. Like, own, own your victories. Um, so anyway, so sometimes these things are not seen as actual skills, but they are. And I think it's important for us to start seeing them as skills and treating them as skills. So for me, the dimension on skills is that Skills are really about the pride we take in our craft. It's about respecting that list and seeing those things as valid skills that we've built up or are building. And if you actually go back and look at this list and think about the list that Rachel shared of skills that are needed for the future, a lot of them are the same. There's a lot of overlap there. So us building and honing those skills and taking them seriously is important for, for our future, for the industry. I also want to say that this requires constant humility um, and curiosity. Um, because as soon as you feel like you have nothing more to learn as a project manager, you're done. Like I told you I've been doing this for 20 years. Um, I, I still, I'm still learning. Um, I just realized, pause for a moment. I want to go back to talents because I'm missing a slide. I'm going to add it in when I share this to you guys, but I have an example of talents in action and how to ask questions in interviews that speak to your talents. So I don't know what happened to that. Um, I don't know what happened to that slide, but I'll put it up for you. So actions that I want you to think about when it comes to skills. I want you to think about the skills that are needed for the responsibilities that you have now in your job. So look at your job description, look at um, you know, what, how, like your um, review, how your, how your performance is, um, is managed or judged. So think about the skills for the responsibilities you have and where those skills fit on this quadrant. And also think about the skills for the responsibilities that you want to have and where they fit on this quadrant. Now, of course, the trick is all those unconscious things we can't see. So how do you see what is not conscious to you? Mentors are helpful in helping you see unconscious incompetence because a good mentor is going to know things you don't know and have skills and experience that you don't have and will be able to point out for you the things that they think you're going to need to know or learn to be successful. So uh, if you have an official mentor in your life, ask them. I actually have a ton of mentors, none of whom know they're my mentors. So just ask people who you respect, like, hey, I want to do something like what you do. Here's what I know now. What do you think I'm missing? What do you think I need to get better at? Peers and team members or people that you are mentoring um, are really effective at helping you see unconscious competence because they see and notice the things that you're good at that they are not good at. So those are good people, those are two good people to ask about seeing the things that are invisible to you. Um, and then think about how you're going to make a plan to move those skills into the next quadrant. Once you're aware that so the easy part is the minute a mentor tells you, these are the things you need to know, you've just moved it from unconscious incompetence to conscious incompetence. Done. Check. Um, but then think about like, okay, how am I going to build those skills and move that into conscious competence? So then we have the next level, which is reliability. Reliability is the repeated application of our talents and skills over time. So we, as project managers, serve, in my mind, three primary audiences. There, there are probably more, but these are the three kind of primary groups that we're serving. We've got clients, we've got teams, and we've got our organization. And what we need to do is think strategically about the outcomes that each of them are thinking and how we're 
helping them, how we are serving those outcomes for them. This reliability concept of like, how are we showing up consistently? This is where we start with every new job, every new client, no matter how experienced you are. Like we can show up with the talents, we can show up with the skills, that's about us, how we're showing up and what we're doing. But for each new client or team, they don't yet know what we do. Like we have to, we have to show, not tell. So I just recently I went to a meeting with a client um, and they don't care how experienced I am. They don't care really that I'm the COO of client. They don't care that I wrote a book. Like they only care about how I show up on that day in that room, what I do, and how I follow up. So I think this is tricky because this is sometimes where I see people who get really experienced start to get cocky about what they do or do not have to do because they're senior or they have a certain level of experience. And it really doesn't matter who you are. You have to show up first with teams and clients in that kind of level of like, I'm just going to show up and do the thing. I'm going to have a consistent application of my talents and skills. So we start here with each new job and client and team. Um, it can be, experience is good, but it can also be a real downfall to assume that our past experiential knowledge will directly transfer into a new team or company or project. It can inform it, but no company, no team is the same. Even within the same company, no two teams are the same. So taking your experience um, and understanding first the way that that group does things now before you come in and start to suggest a better way. So that's the take time to understand the way that exists before you suggest a better way. I sometimes see us as project managers. You know how when you're working with um, developers and you're like, okay, hey, here's this thing and we need to do this other thing and they're like, oh, I gotta rewrite the whole thing. Yeah. That code is garbage, like I just, we have to rewrite the whole thing. Sometimes we do that as project managers about existing processes and um, tools that teams are using. We come in and we're like, I have this better way before we really stop to understand the way that it's being done right now. So take the time to understand the way that it's currently being done in the environment that you're going into before you like tell them all the ways that they're wrong. Um, so this is also where some of the least satisfying parts of our job, the parts that we complain about the most, um, really are the most critical. And I think it helps to reframe it and focus on outcomes. So um, here's an example in my own personal life. I was complaining to someone about um, not wanting to work out because I didn't feel like it. I was like, I know I should work out, but I was like, don't feel like it. And she was like, did you feel like brushing your teeth this morning? And I was like, I mean, no, but I did it. And she's like, yeah, because you like the outcome, as does everyone else around you. Like, you don't brush your teeth because you feel like it. You brush your teeth because you like the outcome. And it, like, reframed for me this idea that, like, I don't have to feel like working out to work out. It can just be a thing I do because I want the outcome. I want it to be over. <laughs> um, this is also where things like typos become like really important. And I don't mean just like one typo, everyone makes mistakes, but I worked with this project manager once and he would constantly spell the client's name wrong. And it like was not even a hard name, but he just would constantly spell it wrong. And I was sitting down with him talking about his performance and I was like, dude, the, this is a problem. And he's like, well, it's just like this one little thing. And I'm like, but it's happening repeatedly. And it means it's undermining my trust in you. And it's undermining the client's trust. Because if you can't take the time and care and attention to get her name right, then how are we trusting you with this budget? How are we trusting you to keep track of all of these requirements? Like these little things, these seemingly little things can really undermine the trust and make it harder for us to engage at this higher level. So when you're struggling with like the things that seem kind of menial, remember that they're bringing you to an outcome that's really important. It's the task itself is not the key, it's the outcome that you're looking for. 
I also think that striving to be reliable and consistent is what gives us an opportunity to be more proactive than reactive. So it's an easy example, sending status reports to the client, same time, same day, or at the very least on the same day, means that what you can do is set aside the time you know you need to get that thing done. So Lynn had that example of blocking out time on your calendar. I think that's a great idea. I also think you need to be very specific about what that time is. Because if you call it desk time or work time, it's very easy for other people to disrespect that time, and it's even easier for you to disrespect that time. Because you're like, well, I have this whole block. Sure, I can give you some of it. Whereas for me, like I know every week I need to send content to our communications director for our staff newsletter. So, and I know it takes me roughly like 30 minutes, maybe less, to like pull all my thoughts together. So I have 30 minutes on my calendar on Tuesday for when I'm gonna do the newsletter. Now, if I need to move it, that's fine, but then I have to be honest with myself about when I'm going to actually complete that thing. Whereas if it's this vague work time, I can come up with all kinds of reasons why a need of someone else is more important and should override that. And it's really, really, really easy in our role to be very reactive, but the more we can think about how we set aside the time we need to make certain things more scheduled and consistent gives us more room to play and be reactive to the right kinds of things outside of that. So going back to my status reports example, like those are a good, a good chance, if we're doing it right, to really pull out of the day to day and ask ourselves, like, how is this going? Are we where we need to be? And too often, I think we're just like, we're putting it together, just like throw everything in the status report and get it out, instead of that kind of think time that Lynn talked about of like, hang on, let me pull out for a minute, let me look at the big picture of this and say, are we tracking or are we not? Another strategic opportunity. Are we headed toward the outcome that we want or have we gotten off track? Every single weekly status, or if you're more agile and you're sprinting, every single one starts to help you understand, are, is our trajectory where it needs to go, or are we in trouble? Do we need to take action? Um, there's kind of this like well-worn story about a professor who gives his uh, students this vase and then these containers of like big rocks, pebbles, sand, and water and says like, okay, figure out how to fit all those things into this vase. And like the answer is you have to do it rocks, then pebbles, then sand, then water, or you can't fit it all in. If you do, if you do it in the opposite order, you don't have enough room for the rocks. And the moral of the story is you have like the rocks, those are those big things we know we need to get done that we have to make time for because there will not be magically time to get that done outside of all of the sand and water, which is like email, Slack, people coming to your desk, like all those things. Like that stuff is always gonna exist. And if you're not careful about how you manage it, it will fill up your vase. And then the rocks get piled on top of that. And you know what that is? That's working all weekend. That's working till 11 o'clock at night. That's all of these kind of like lack of boundary things that we end up doing because we're trying to do a good job. So this is our opportunity. The reliability and consistency is our opportunity to get better at carving out that time and showing up for people in the way that we promised them we would show up. Um, so reliability really is about building trust. And trust is gonna be really essential at our, at our next level. So I want you to think about how reliably you're applying your skills and your talents to serve the outcomes that your clients and your team and your organization are looking for. And where and how can you shift your approach to be more consistent and more proactive? And where can you set boundaries to protect the time that you need to hone your craft? Um, I wanna talk a little bit about boundaries. I might have this in a later slide, but I'm gonna talk about it now. Um, Lynn talked about burnout. And I am like a classic example of this. 
I actually, this actually, this talk right now is the last work-related thing that I'm doing for the entire month of September. I'm taking a sabbatical for all of September. Um, because what I did over the last 14 months is worked myself into a state of complete and total burnout. And like the only way that I could think to get myself out of it was like, I had to do a hard reboot. I need a full month to just like step away. And this is not something I'm good at. In uh, Dave and uh, Mika's session, I wrote, hi, my name is Megan and I suck at relaxing. <laughs> so this next three weeks is gonna be a challenge for me, but it was because it's on me. I didn't set the right boundaries. I was so focused on like, no, I have to do these things and all these things are so important. And the truth about the kind of work that we do is that it's like a treadmill. It's never really done. So it's up to us to set the boundaries around what we're going to do and how far we're going to go and to prioritize. Um, as we've been kind of moving more and more into Agile as, a, as an organization at Clockwork, one of my favorite parts about Scrum in particular is relentless prioritization. And one of the things that I took into my sort of personal agile practice was prioritization and force ranking the things that I need to get done in my life, in my day, whatever, like what's gonna give. And the truth is that if we don't consciously do that for ourselves, the world does it for us. And it almost never does it in the order that we actually want. Right? And then we end up putting ourselves last and we end up feeling resentful and, and burned out. So set aside the time that you need and relentlessly prioritize the things that you need to get done. Because everything can't be important. If everything's important, then nothing is important. So moving into adaptability. Adaptability, this is the really fun part because adaptability is where we get to improvise, right? Reliability is where we need to be structured and consistent. Adaptability is when we get to improvise. Now I mentioned that adaptability is about building trust and trust is really key for improvisation, right? Like improv, if I'm up here improvising with someone else, I am trusting that when I throw something out, they're gonna catch it, build on it, throw it back. Uh, this is referred to in improv as yes and, which you like may have heard before. Or if you read Tina Fey has a book called Bossy Pants that's funny and good, um, and she talks a lot about how improv sort of helped her think about the world of, of being a boss. So in order to get to a yes and kind of state, you have to have this high level of trust and, and good communication. So when it comes to adaptability, this is about finding the right balance between reliability and adaptability, the consistency and adaptability. And that to me is truly the art of project management. That is the art and strategy of project management. What is the outcome that I'm seeking? How can I get there in the best possible way within constraints? And sometimes those constraints are about the reliability and consistency. I would love to use this other tool, but I can't. So how do I improvise within the, the constraints that I have? As project managers, I think we have to sometimes work to resist the desire to control. Like ultimately, a lot of us are in this role because we know the best way to get things done and we would like everyone else to do what we say. <laughs> or maybe that's just me, I'm an action PM. Like, come on. Um, but control is not the job. Control is an illusion. So how can we Adapt, how can we find this right rhythm and balance between reliability and adaptability? This is how we show our teams and our organizations and our clients that we know one size fits all doesn't work and that we're willing to customize and meet them where they are. When we stay also relentlessly focused on those outcomes, Failure gets easier to understand and explain and recover from. So when Aaron was talking about failures, if you think about failures in the context of uh, an outcome, it's a lot easier to understand. Like, uh, okay, my team member didn't log their hours because they were afraid the project would go over budget. Okay, wrong action, right intention. I can understand that as a project manager, I can work with that instead of assuming so-and-so didn't log their hours because they're lazy, because they don't care, right? Like, so if we're focused on the outcome and understanding the outcome that someone was looking for, that helps us. 
I also think that quadrant of competence can help us understand failures and mistakes better because what we think of as like stupid mistakes, those are almost never the result of like laziness or, or malice, but of unconscious incompetence. They just didn't know better. So things in that quadrant all often show up as what we think of if we know as bad intuition. Like you just had the wrong intuition. That's how unconscious incompetence shows up. So using that as a framing um, helps us understand failures and figure out how to work with our team members or our clients on those failures and also to explain them to the client or explain them to our company. So all of this is important because adaptability is about the experience that we're creating for our team, for our customer, for our organization. And how people feel makes a bigger difference in how loyal they are to us, going back to our sort of ride or die theme, than effectiveness or even how easy it is to work with us. Um, there's also a relationship between adaptability and inclusion because we adapt to create an environment that's more inclusive. We become stronger partners when we adapt because I think that the way that we truly become indispensable to clients and teams and our organizations, once we get past the reliability aspect of it, of like Megan shows up and does what she says she's gonna do, the next level of that is we become indispensable through service. What is the service that I'm providing? How am I showing up for you? A client that I was working with recently, this was probably six months ago, there was a whole big blow up in a thing that um, she was working on. There were several agencies involved in this. She pulled us all into a room and she was like, we have got to fix this. No one can leave this room until we get this figured out. This was probably like noon. And by like 10 p.m., people were like drifting away. And I sat in that room with her until 2 a.m. And I will not ever forget the like look of gratitude on her face when we both left the room. And she, and this actually was part of my inspiration for the ride or die. And what I want you to take away from this is not I worked until 2 a.m. I just told you I burned myself out. Like, come on, I know that's not healthy. If that was a pattern, like if this was like a client expects me to work till 2 a.m. every night, like that's a different thing. What I want you to take away from that is that I was by her side until she got what she needed. Even though at the end of the day, it wasn't really my thing to deliver. Some of the other agency people should have been there sitting by her side. But I was like, I am not gonna leave her alone in this moment. I would have done the same thing for my internal team if we were dealing with a bug till two in the morning. I know I can't code it for you, but I'm gonna sit by your side until it gets done. That's how I'm gonna show you that I am here for you. You can trust me. I will advocate for you, I will show up, I will serve you, I will serve this project. Um, another like smaller example is we had a facilities manager once, we had a client that would come in really regularly, same day, same time for like weeks and weeks and weeks over this long course of this project and she drank decaf and he went out and bought this little cheap coffee machine and on the days that she came into the office, he would make her a little pot of decaf and he like labeled it with her name. It was like the tiniest little gesture and it created this incredible feeling of loyalty and goodwill with her. And for me, that was an example inside of our organization of somebody kind of doing that job crafting. He did not have to do that. That was not in his job description. But he, as a facilities person, as overhead, directly contributed to the bottom line of the company by directly serving a really important client to us. So how we, how we make people feel shows up in that adaptability, how we shift to serve them. So adaptability is about service to others. And I really believe, in case you can't tell by how forceful I am about it, that I, project management is servant leadership. Like that is what we're here to do. So when we're in a job that aligns with our talents, when we think about our work as a craft, when we built trust with our team, our client or organization, that gives us the confidence to improvise because improvisation also requires confidence in ourselves and in the person that we're, the person or the organization that we're improvising with. 
The improvisation, the adaptability helps us adjust our approach to better serve the humans that we work with. And our experience and our good judgment helps us discern what the right, what the right approach is. So adaptability is service. So for you, think about who your constituent groups are. Think about specific team members. How are you serving them? How can you serve them better? Where might you have built enough trust to improvise with your clients, your team, and your company? Um, and here's where I have this note about burnout, because it can be hard to balance this concept of service and the idea of self-care. But you, that is a thing that, that you need to do, and it's not always an easy thing to do. But what burnout can do is make you question your job. It can make you question your company. It can make you question yourself. And one of the reasons I think people end up leaving jobs, Lynn and I were talking about this the other day, you know how people quit a job and then they're like, I'm gonna take like three weeks off before I start my next job. I really think it's because a lot of people leave jobs because they get burned out and what resets them is not so much the new job, it's the break that they take between those two jobs where they sort of rebuild, control, alt, delete on their brain and then they, they restart and they're able to approach problems in a fresh, more resilient way. So set boundaries, make promises with care, renegotiate the agreements that you make. One of the quick points I wanted to make about promises is that a promise is really a contract between you and another person. And the good news about a contract is you can always renegotiate it. So if I say I'm gonna do something and then I can't do it, that's okay as long as I tell you I can't do it and I recommit to a different time when I am going to do it. So this is another area where we can set a boundary is how can I renegotiate an agreement that I've made if I can't actually meet it anymore. Okay, so partnership is when our pronouns change. Partnership is when you and me become we. Grammatically, I think this should be you and I become we, but you and me become we rhymed and sounded very cool, <laughs> so just go with me on it. So when, when our pronouns change, things like you logged too many hours becomes like we spent more time on development than we planned, what should we do? When we hit this level of like this ride or die strategic partnership, our clients don't just need us to execute, they actually trust that we can execute. And they start asking questions like, what could we do, what should we do, instead of just like what comes next, what's the next task? And our companies and teams are like, we want you on every project. Um, Crystal had this example in her presentation about um, when you ask someone to do something in your organization and they say, I'll do it because it's you. And that that is a signal that you've achieved a level of kind of partnership with that person that like they don't have to do it, but they wanna do it because it's you. And I think sometimes we mistake that for like, oh, it's a personal favor, they just like me. I think it's actually a really strong signal that that person sees you as a partner, that they trust you in a way that they don't trust other people. So how long it takes you to get to the top of this pyramid will vary from team to company to project. And you can exist at different levels of this pyramid with different clients, with a company. You can also drop on this pyramid and have to climb your way back up. It's sort of, it's a journey, it's a process. The bad news about the top of that pyramid is that we don't get to decide when we get there, our partners do. Sort of like you can't be like, I'm cool, other people have to tell you you're cool. <laughs> Side note, I'm cool. Um, oh, also, I don't know if you noticed, but in my like intro, like with my photo, I'm literally wearing the exact same outfit, and I was like, I really need to diversify my clothing options, apparently. Um, so we don't decide when we get here, our partners do. But the good news is we can encourage them to get there. Here is a thing that I do. I start using we pronouns immediately when I work with a client. I'm, I'm not assuming that we're already at that level of partnership. I'm not behaving in an overly familiar way, but I am indicating to them where I want us to go. I am indicating to them how I see our relationship. I'm not on the other side, I am with you on the same side of the table. So there are signals we can send to our clients and our teams that we wanna be there. 
So for this top level of the pyramid can represent our career, it can represent a particular job, it can represent a project. When you think about the path toward partnership, think about where you're at with your clients. Sort of place different client relationships, different relationships with team members or your company on this pyramid. And one really powerful question to ask yourself is, is it possible to be seen as a partner? So the note that I have on this one is, People who saw you grow up sometimes have trouble seeing you as a grown up. And that happens in our professional careers. Sometimes you have to leave a job because they can't see how you've changed. They've known you for too long. You came in as an intern and they still see you as that. Um, so this uh, radio person that I listen to calls it powdered butt syndrome, which is once someone has powdered your butt, they have a hard time uh, taking advice from you about anything. <laughs> Uh, similar, but hopefully no one in your office has powdered your butt. Um, I don't judge. Um, so look back on your past experiences and think about, have you gotten to this level of partnership and not even realized that you got there? What did that look like? How did that show up? So inspiring closing statement. Are you ready? So one thing that I observed is that I was not less effective as a project manager when I was not someone's boss. And I was probably more effective because they were way more likely to tell me if I was full of shit. And the reason why I think that's important is because so often, and this kind of keys into what Rachel was saying, I think we don't know how to own our power as project managers. We're waiting for someone to give us permission to do something, to show up in a certain way. But I believe that we can and should show up as leaders. So don't wait for someone to tell you to be strategic. Don't wait to be a boss to act like a leader. Just show up and show up differently. So that's it. Thank you so much.